Welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. My name is Dilthe Doherty, and in this podcast series, I will be interviewing investors, advisors, recruitment entrepreneurs, and recruiters who are based all over the world. And we will be discussing how to set up, scale, and operate a world-class recruitment company. This morning, I have been speaking to Ken Charles, who is based out of Tokyo. He's originally from New York, and after university, he set up and sold a couple of technology startup companies uh, before moving to Tokyo to become an agency recruiter. He did that for a few years, got really good at it, and decided to set up his own company. He is really into technology and much more so than most of the recruitment founders that I speak to. And he has invested in hiring a developer as his second hire along with his co-founder and they're using a lot of artificial intelligence uh, to help them find engage and uh, with candidates and clients and organize their day so they're left being able to spend their time consulting and closing deals so a really cool company, um, forward thinking, um, enjoyed talking to him about his vision. Um, it's not your typical recruitment agency that is going to be built for scale. Maybe it will be someday, but right now they're really focused on, on you know, getting the absolute mo- most out of what technology is out there from from using what tools are out there and for de- from developing their own technology in-house. Um, so if you're interested in artificial intelligence, and how it can help your recruitment business, or maybe you're bogged down in administration and wondering, how can I make more money from my day? Then this episode's a really good one. So over to Ken. Ken Charles, how are Hi. you? Good, good, good. So is it the evening time there? Where am I calling? Where are you in the world? <laughs> I'm based in Tokyo, Japan. It's about uh, six o'clock at night over here. Okay, cool. I've got my coffee in front of me. What are you, what are you having for your dinner? Anything exotic? Uh, you probably want to know what it is. A thing called Oden. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's what yeah. I'll be eating tonight. You're eating it's, the god uh, of war. <laughs> something like that yeah yeah o-d-e-n though yeah it's uh it's like a stew i guess if you were to describe it but it's not it's a japanese thing i've never seen anything like it outside but i'm i'm, I'm, I'm hooked on it so all right <laughs> sounds good yeah um, yeah all right well, look thanks for coming on the show um i suppose what we normally do is we backtrack a little bit and ask you how you got into our industry and then we we, we, we figure out that journey that took you from what I presume is the United States yep. to Tokyo. Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do it. Um, so I guess uh, you want me to kind of give my backstory a little bit? Yeah, yeah, jump in. Okay, okay, sure. So, I mean, before we – just so today, I guess um, – so I, I just recently from the beginning of this year, I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called uh, executivesearch.ai, which is – a uh, recruiting company based in for the technology uh, industry based in Tokyo. Mm-hmm. Now I'm kind of a, at this point I'm a bit of a Japan veteran I guess, but um, you know like a lot of recruiters, I guess I had a bit of a how do you say roundabout path to get where I am, which seems to be common in our industry I guess. So sure uh, it is, yeah. yeah. So for me it was um, I grew up right outside of New York City in, in America um, in a state called Connecticut. Um, it's about an hour outside of New York and I went to college in New York during college. I studied, uh, for one year in Japan. It was a bit of a excursion to get out of Dodge for a while. And I really enjoyed it. It was a good time. I learned Japanese to a pretty good level. Um, and then when I graduated in New York, um, I had one goal and one mission in mind, which was to get a job that could pay me enough money to, have my own apartment in Manhattan in New York, which is 
not the cheapest place as you can imagine, right? So I uh, started applying for jobs. And actually the first uh, really good offer I got was with a Japanese company because I could speak a little bit of Japanese, but it was as a recruiter. And it was as an internal recruiter um, and it was to hire uh, basically sales engineers across the country for them. So, you so started, I did that for a, You started on the dark side. Yeah, so I started as a corporate recruiter and then uh, I took to it right away. I mean, I really enjoyed it. I was very good at it. But um, I remember um, two things were basically my motivating fact, motivating factor for why I wanted to change. One was, uh, you know, the, they laid out the career path for me, which was basically to become, you know, an HR generalist, HR manager, which I had no interest in. And then the other thing was, um, I remember I had a great, you know, uh, quarter and I, I had all my you know hiring goals and everything. And then they pulled me in a room and they gave me my bonus or no, so my raise, they raised my salary. Um, and it, it was the, the raise was equivalent to about 30 cents an hour raise is what it was going to be. And I knew what the, we were paying these agencies that we were using as well. And I said, this is crazy. He said, you know, I could, if I made the same number of placements as a, you know, an agent recruiter, I'd make a lot more money. So it didn't take much for me to, to jump ship and join an agency. So within, I think a year out of college, I was working at a, uh, at a IT recruiting agency, um, in basically based on wall street in New York. What was that um, like? That was, what, what year was that in? Well, that was two th- beginning of 2006. Okay. So this was like the middle of the, you know, subprime real estate bubble. And it was very interesting because, you know, we were just, you know, uh, I mean, I was a, you know, two second year recruiter working with a bunch of, you know, relatively junior recruiters on Wall Street. And even we were just, I mean, the, the, the money that was reaching us, we were like cockroaches on the ground running around, you know, eating scraps. And it was just absurd. I mean, it was just like, it was a free for all. I mean, hundreds of open wrecks. I mean, it was, it was just madness. I was making six figures, you know, when I was 24, 25 years old as a recruiter, you know, it was great. Um, you know, you think it's going to last forever, but you know, obviously, it didn't work out that well <laughs> that way. But uh, were you, yeah, were, you so there, was, were you there in the crash? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So we were. Um, Did it punch I was in the working. Base? Well, I mean, uh, like I'll give you a story. We had a guy who was uh, almost seventy years old, lifetime recruiter. This you know, old New York recruiter. And the day Lehman Brothers was his number one client. And then the day, the day they, they, they went under, he retired. He said, that's it. I'm out. <laughs> he finally retired that day. But I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, we, we, we went from a hundred open positions to two open positions, you know, I mean, it was just, it was brutal. Um, so that was, you know, the, I mean, I had to get out of the industry actually for, uh, it was about, I, felt, I officially left in the beginning of 2009. Um, but 2008, the whole year was just a bloodbath, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I had to come up with all, you know, some other plan for a while because, it was pretty obvious the recruiting market was 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 not going to bounce back right away, particularly not for uh, you know around Wall Street. You know, um, yeah, uh, you jumped into you jumped into a bit of a a Japanese translation thing by the looks of it. You did yeah, that for a few years. Did you make a few pounds at that? Yeah, basically, um, I had uh, as a hobby. I had been doing a lot of translation myself. I knew a lot of other translators, hobbyist translators, primarily to to really study the Japanese language and. Um, I knew a lot of good people that were very smart and very good at it. And, you know, I took some of the business skills that I had learned through recruiting um, to, you know, put together a small agency, primarily actually to start selling recruiting or sorry, um, selling translation services to companies that were doing translation for like Japanese uh, video contents and books and comics and things, which is pretty big, like Japanese animation, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, it started as a side business, basically, to kind of as my commissions were dropping, you know, month after month, you know, to kind of just keep keep the lights on and make some money. And then what happened was uh, by basically by the end of 2008, it hit that crossover point where my side business was making a lot more money than my, uh, you know, my day job. And so it became pretty clear that, you know, for the time being, I was going to basically turn it into a, you know, a startup company. And um, I did for a couple of years. I mean, just grinded. Um, I didn't know that much about business at the time. So, I mean, I wish I charged a lot more money for our services. But, I mean, we had a, we had a lot of good customers, a lot of good business. And that um, I ended up um, being able to sell the company in 2010 to a company that was from San Francisco. But they had an a office in Tokyo. And then, actually, that, that's when I moved back to Japan. It was originally back in 2010 okay. um, after I sold the business. Yeah. So, so uh so in the recession, you managed to build a business, sell it, 
and you're a young guy, you're on top of the world, you think I'm going to go to Japan. <laughs> what was your plan? Did you think I'm going to get back into recruitment? It's funny, yeah. So I kind of did. And it was, uh, I, you know, I sold the company. Um, about a year later, I had left the company I sold it to, you know, um, kind of after the transition. And I was deciding what I was going to do next. And then for me, you know, I did think to go back into recruiting because I enjoyed it. I only left the industry because, you know, just I felt like I kind of just had to for you know, reasons. But um, I was uh, applying to some, um, you know, recruiting companies in Tokyo. I set up a bunch of meetings because um, I didn't know the recruiting market in Japan at all. So I set up a bunch of meetings with, like, with a number of companies and uh, I'll, I, I was really close to joining. And it's funny because today I would never do this, but at the time, I was very close to joining one of the really big recruiting firms. Um, actually, it's a British company, Robert Walters. Um, yeah, I worked for them for three years. Oh, did you really? Yeah. So their Tokyo operation was pretty sizable. Um, they had uh, probably a couple hundred people. Um, but they um, – uh, and I had my – you know, basically my final interview, and they were going to offer me a job. You know, it was, it, was, it, was a good, it was a good match at the time. And it was – I remember I had my final interview, and I came home. And I was, uh, I think I was having a drink and kind of just winding down and celebrating, you know, that I was going to get an offer from this company. And then uh, that was the day, it was March 11th, 2011. That was the day of the giant earthquake in Japan. Oh, yeah. And, nice. Yeah. So if you recall, I mean, it was, a, it was a big deal. And what happened was I was sort of getting flashbacks to um, uh, what happened, you know, to the markets after 2008. You know, and it was very unclear at the time, you know, what is this going to mean for the for business in Japan at the moment? Is this it, it felt like it was going to be a rough time to start, um, you know, getting into recruiting in Tokyo. Right. Because it was really just, a, you know, it was a it was a punch to the jaw for, I mean, the whole market. Right. So um, I had to make a decision. So basically nobody was hiring at the moment. And they, um, you know, it, it was a, a headcount freeze across the whole industry for a few months. And I ended up um, making the decision to I joined a. a a uh, friend of mine who wanted to do a startup in San Francisco. So I, I joined him as basically his business guy. He was the engineer and we launched a tech startup in San Francisco um, for about a year and a half, two years after that. So did you move uh, to San Francisco or were you based out of Japan at this stage? No, I moved to San Francisco. So oh, cool. I, um, yeah, so basically I saw it as, as, you know, just timing and opportunity. He had just sold a company in, in uh, China and did very well. And he wanted to do another company in San Francisco he had come to Tokyo. I had known him for years and he kind of, we, you know, we mutually decided we wanted to do this. So we moved to San Francisco and we launched a, a tech company, which was very cool for me because, you know, I had been an IT recruiter and I've experienced hiring IT people and pretty knowledgeable about it. But being on the side of actually building the internal team, you know, for a company and then also being kind of the head of sales, you know, the de facto, de facto you know, head of, you know, everything, right? I mean, yeah. HR, finance, you name it. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Today, I would never I would never build a, you know, engineering team in San Francisco again. It was if you want to burn through all of your investment money, that's a good way to do it. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, that doesn't make it doesn't yeah. make sense to do that, does it? You know, no, <laughs> no. Every every guy we hired had a standing offer from Google to join. You know, I mean, it's 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 not it's a tough market. I mean, you got to be well funded to build a team in San Francisco. You know, so it was a, it's a fun city to do business in. I enjoy visiting there. Um, I eventually, I, I left because we, uh, we got to the point where, you know, we were burning through cash and we had to stop taking paychecks, my, you know, myself and my founder. And it was just too much. I mean, it was, you know, the, for the sake of the business, it made sense to, to just get out because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't say they're not taking a salary forever. Sure. Um, was life yeah. in San Francisco fun or was it just all work? <laughs> I mean, no, it's it's a mix of both, of course. You know, I mean, it's a it's a fun city. There's a lot of uh, one thing about San Francisco is people are very open to you know new uh, new ideas, new companies, new concepts, you know, new relationships. So it's a very easy city to meet people, to network. You know, and and that they they have that part of it down. The, the problems with San Francisco really have to do with just the you know, just some of the, you know, the, the echo chamber bubbles that are there and also just the, the fact that it's so damn expensive. I mean, that's just pretty much what it comes down to, but going there for business trips and, you know, I mean, those kind of things I love to this day, I love doing it, but uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm good on living in San Francisco <laughs> for one lifetime. That was enough. Yeah. yeah. The, the famous Baz Luhrmann uh, sunscreen, uh, if, if, <laughs> you, you know, you know the one I'm on about, don't you? If, uh, Live, yeah, in, yeah. Li live in New York for a while, but uh, leave before it makes you too hard and 
live in California <laughs> for a while, but he preferred Mickey too soft. Didn't, exactly. It, yes. it, it, didn't sound like, it didn't sound like uh, that, that it was too soft for you, though. That, uh, well, so, I was I was in IT, right, in tech, right. So I mean, that's that's like the mecca, you know what I mean. So, it's that was that part of it wasn't bad, you know. And I learned a hell of a lot, you know. I mean, let me tell you, like being in the heart of the industry, you know what I mean. Like you really you get to see, you know, like how the sausage is made, you know what I mean. Which is it's useful from a business standpoint, particularly as a recruiter, because you know how it is. A lot of recruiters don't get to see enough of their industry from the inside, you know. So yeah, um, that part was cool. It's an interesting one because it's it, we're now at a point where it's not a strategy for most companies where they're trying to embed themselves in the community of developers and developers, yeah. developers hate recruiters. Like that's yeah. you know, so, yeah. so, 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 I mean, so. being like, you know, having some authenticity, like, you know, being able to actually talk and like, you know, actually know what you're talking about is with like developers, for example, I mean, is, is a huge asset. I mean, it's really, it's, it's helped my career a tremendous amount because I can do that. But I mean, it's, you know, most, but particularly in Japan, I mean, most of the recruiters, they come here, they teach English for a few years and they become a recruiter. So, I mean, they don't have any, any, you know, real applied business skills for, you know, a lot of people. Right. So, I mean, it's a, a definitely a big leg up. Um, so, I mean, I was fortunate, you know, I had it, but then, you know, ultimately I ended up moving back to Japan a bit over five years ago. Um, and uh, that's when I decided this was the time to really to, to get back into recruitment. You know, I, I had, done basically two essentially two startups back to back and i was good i I didn't want to own my own company at the time it was you know i wanted somebody else to deal with that you know so i I looked for a firm to join and that's what i ended up doing um which was i mean yeah that was 2000 end of 2013 i guess and and so you you joined a firm there was it a small firm a large firm was was english the, the spoken language in the office what was it like yeah it's it's it was basically um so yeah when i got back I decided to do like just really understand the market and understand the different companies, big companies, small companies, boutiques. I ended up joining a uh, basically a, a, at the time, you know, I, I wouldn't even call them midsize. They were kind of smallish. I mean, I think I was maybe employee number 27 or 28 or something like that. And they had built a uh, very good um, headhunting practice for the healthcare industry, which is in Japan, the healthcare industry is really massive because there's a ton of old people. There's a ton of, um, you know, obviously national insurance, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a big business. So they had built a really strong business in just a, number, just a few years in healthcare. Now they didn't have an IT division and I was basically brought on to uh, start the IT business from scratch. So my, my thought was basically, hey, here's a company that did something pretty well, pretty fantastic in healthcare let's replicate this model in IT. And that's the reason I joined um, that firm that was, uh, you know, in the, for the last four plus years of my life, that's what I was, you know, was doing was building up that business. And that's a tough, um, and was, that's a tough ask when you're jumping into a business that's known for another discipline, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, and there's some growing pains with that, you know, um, but like you said, so the, or like you asked the, so the company was owned by a Canadian guy. Um, and so obviously English was the dominant language. They primarily, um, you know, were working with, uh, you know, uh, foreign capital companies. So you're looking at like big, they work with big pharma companies and medical device companies and, you know, these kind of, you know, these, those this, kind of businesses. This Apex, is it? Apex, yeah, is the name of the company. Yep. So they're, today, I think they're about 60, 70 people. Um, and they scaled out to a number of verticals like, you know, uh, finance and some other areas. So basically, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a bit of a, you know, uh, interesting thing because they had really good fundamentals for headhunting for their industry, but you know, not everything applies. You know, one to one to, for example, IT, which is a bit more fast moving, bit more, um, you know, uh, Pro- product you know, driven. Yeah, 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 and very competitive too. I mean, it's so it's kind of uh, it was. I tried to you know make the mix of the best that they have with what my knowledge and experience and kind of apply it and do it. I was at the time it was a really great uh, situation for myself because. I didn't really particularly want to, you know, uh, own the company or be the guy that has to worry about, you know, the payroll and keeping the lights on and, you know, all that stuff and everything. Um, so it was a good, it was a good match when I joined and, you know, we built up a good business for a few years. Um, it was, uh, and I was managing a, you know, a IT you know, team over there. Eventually, you know, we got to the point where, um, it, you know, I wanted to, you know, break off and do, do something, um, on my own, um, partly because, uh, you know, the IT um, wasn't in it wasn't in the DNA of the company. I feel there's a lot of recruiting companies, you know, actually like, for example, how do you actually leverage IT to make you a better recruiting business? 
you know, that's something that a lot of recruiting firms, I don't think fully wrap their mind around because they don't have IT as like a DNA of their business. Right. But mm-hmm. I've always been around IT and I've, I've felt, you know, there's a lot more we could be doing to be a more modern business. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like, um, that was kind of my, you know, thought process for, Hey, I can't do this inside of this. There's just too many legacy things that are going to keep me from executing my vision for what kind of business we could build. Why not start something, you know, um, you know, new externally and mold the company to kind of be this really high tech business, you know, where, you know, we're trying to leverage, you know, it internally to be a good recruiting business. And then also, you know, um, you know, work with our clients who are exclusively it, you know, companies, um, and it's been good since we did that. So. so, so let's let's talk about that. That's your latest company. Let, oh, what yep. what was your vision? What what do you ex- what do you mean exactly by leveraging technology to make sure you're getting better results? Like, can you jump into yeah. what that means? Yeah, sure, sure. So, I mean, it's it's just kind of a, a simple concept, I think. So, our you know our, our company's name is kind of a there's two sides to it, right? I mean, it's executive search and then dot ai right so we have the ai and we have the executive search it's good name, so executive man. search yeah thank you i mean it was uh, i was i was glad the domain was available when i bought it thank so, you were. yeah so the uh, basically you know the executive search is the idea that we're focused on senior level positions and it, it could be technology side or it could be um, you know corporate side or sales side front office stuff but basically um, it's the idea that we're focused on really high impact areas. You know, that's kind of the, the is this, that, does this mean C level positions or does it mean it, no, things from management upwards or does it mean so we'll, specialist upwards? Yeah. So we'll work with like, uh, you know, uh, for example, we work with a multi-billion dollar internet company, you know, that might, we might be hiring directors for them, for example. Right. Um, but then we work with, um, startups who might be doing their VP of engineering. Like right now we're working VP engineering roles. Um, you know, th- those kind of areas, right? And what, C-level, and what, if, you know, what if that, what if that VP comes to you and says, I need five developers, are you going to walk away from that? Well, it's, uh, you know, everything's a negotiation, right? But I mean, typically, you know, we, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it depends on the, you know, the scope, but we, we generally want to go for high impact guys, you know? So sure. the, the reality is the salaries are getting so good for the, uh, engineers that it's not, I mean, you could, you could justify doing a lot of, you know, decent, you know, that, that's good why I, impact. Yeah, that's why I asked. Yeah, I mean, like, it's, you know, we're seeing even in Japan, the salaries have gotten to pretty decent for the um, individual engineers that are pretty good. So we keep that, honestly speaking, we keep that part of our business alive because it's, it's, a, it's a pain point for every client that we work with. It's if you can deliver engineers, you're always going to have a client that wants to work with you. You know, you're not always going to have a client that wants to, Hire at that moment, you know, some director of no, no, but if but if you but if you own all the relationships in the senior end, you can build out your lower end function exactly for for delivering. So it does make sense to to at least brand yourself in in that remit because you know that's where the that's where the future growth will be. Um, Oh, absolutely. So you get it. uh, Yeah, of course. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, So you said we, you're the CEO. Yep. Walk me through your seven months in. Walk, walk me through how many people do you have working with you right now? Oh, we're tiny. You know, we're tiny. I've got uh, a, a co founder who's uh, basically doing the you know, heavy lifting for a lot of the candidate meetings. You know, doing, we're, we're a headhunting company, so we do a lot of meetings and a lot of, uh, a lot of that work. And then we have a developer who works part time who helps with the development. Um, right. and that's our team. Yeah, right now. But cool. we're expanding out. No, that that that's cool. So, what is the developer remit? What what is the AI piece of what you ah, did? So we didn't talk about that part. Yeah. So basically, um, I was doing a lot of this at my previous company, which was there's a lot of tech that I saw that was being developed out in Silicon Valley that was primarily being marketed towards the sales industry, but it applies really great, like really well to the um, recruiting industry, right? Lately, there's been a couple of services, things that are coming up that are good for potentially marketed towards recruiting, but that's a recent development. So the idea was, okay, you know, you look at a room full of recruiters, what do they do all day? I mean, the fact of the matter is, a, a, you know, you could automate a significant portion of the day-to-day work of most recruiters. And I would it, say 80%. Right. Right. Easy. And it's, it's just people don't do it because one, they don't know how Two is just the model is just, like Robert Walters is a good example. You know, oh, they know. Did, did, did you did you actually work for Robert Walters for a little bit? No, 
No, okay. I did not. But, I, but I, mean, I mean, what I'm saying is from a financial perspective, they can shove a guy in, you know, a, a room full of guys that they know what they're going to pay him and they know generally what kind of output they're going to expect if they hit their KPIs for whatever. And it's a simple, straightforward model. And that's why they do it. But it's not efficient at all. It's ridiculous. And like, I believe that, you know, the this industry is getting more competitive. Um, and uh, I mean, it's if you're not, you know, leveraging tools and things to be efficient, um, you're going to be left behind. And I saw it. I saw it at, you know, uh, you know, other companies that are based here in Tokyo that are just their, their business is, is starting to slow down because they're not keeping up with the trends. So and we I wanted think, to. Yeah. Like, oh, I, and I think like early thinking on this came from the four, the four hour work week, right? Where, yeah. where, where we look at like we, if anybody's listening to this and they want to, they want to know how to make their business more efficient. I would say document everything you do in a week and then work out what things that, that what things in that list can be done by somebody else at a cheaper at a cheaper rate. And then I would say, OK, can that be turned into a script and will it affect influence at any stage? So the, the, the hard piece is when people are doing this, they do too much too soon and they lose the consultative piece of what we do. So yep. it's, what I try and what I try and do is, is to make sure that everything that I do, and, and I, I don't have it all figured out. And um, everything that I do is, is about me having time to speak to candidates, clients and create content. Cause they're the three areas that I can have enough influence in the journey of a candidate. We, we do, we do work on, how many touch points that we have with them. But a lot of that can be automated now as long as they know, you know, you're doing the feedback thing right and all the rest. But even a lot of that can be, can be automated. Now, what I don't have the skills for is probably what you're doing, which is putting that into work, work scripts. Can you, yeah. can, can you jump into what your kind of process is for that? And, and, oh, and... Yeah, so we basically, I mean, we have a piece of tech called uh, headhunt.ai, which is our internal platform that we uh, basically we've put together a lot of custom development, a lot of off the shelf software. I mean, for a startup, like for, for a recruiting startup company, our IT budget is, is much higher than probably most businesses. We're paying a lot of money for a lot of good tech, right? Now, um, the automation is a big part of it. And then also the data science behind it. So that's the part that most companies don't do a good job with is actually really digging into the numbers. You know, we have so many interactions with candidates, so much actually, there's enough data being generated for you to actually, you know, make uh, scientifically accurate, you know, assessments of your day-to-day -day work. What's actually moving the needle for where you're getting business from? Um, but if you don't actually have that data indexed properly and being able to analyze it properly, you can't do anything with it. So we've basically been, you know, uh, building a system that allows us to, you know, really, you know, okay, we're, we're taking off a new search. We can rapidly test out, okay, what kind of pitches are going to, people are going to respond better to, what kind of segments um, are people going to respond better to, you know, really A-B testing everything possible and then being able to take that out to market. What that does is, because we're doing, you know, headhunting, so we're going after, um, you know, we're trying to get, you know. Let's, uh, let's, let's, break, let's break that into real terms for somebody. Sure. Because it's, I, I find that people can't like when people are talking about their services, they can talk a little bit general on things because you understand it, but maybe somebody who yeah. doesn't have a tech background won't. So I'm the client. I need a, I need a VP of engineering. Yeah. I say to you, I need a VP of engineering. Go. What, what do you do? How do you, how do you deliver that from your technology? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, look, we're not going to, we can't give up everything because that's our, that's our proprietary methods, but I'll tell you what we, what we do. One is, okay, the data, right? How do you actually get the data? How do you get, you know, where do you find out where all these people are, right? How do you, you know, crawl through, particularly in Japan? So in Japan, like LinkedIn has a market penetration of under 2% in the market, right? So you can't just go find everybody in the market on LinkedIn. There's a whole bunch of other methods and things you have to do in order to map out the market and figure out who's available, right? So you can leverage technology to help with that and to do that, right? Now, once you get those people, how do you actually, you know, uh, you know, go after them in a way that's going to make them respond to you when they're not actually responding to other 
candidates. Now, the piece I missed in between is also how do you get the contact information for those candidates, right? All of that can be powered through technology. Um, I've seen it in my, I've, I've, I've seen it with my own eyes just recently. You know, there are some AI based tools now where you can get like, they can outperform any human being for finding contact details for candidates. Like, I mean, it's, it's the technology is here today. Um, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's, and so that's like case step number one, right? We're going to get a more thorough market map of who's available than a lot of other places could. Then the next step is basically, okay, getting in front of these people and getting them to respond to you, you know, and there's a lot of different methods for how we do that. But I mean, like you said, it's a lot of touch points. It's a lot of, you know, quality content that we're using to get people to respond to us. There's a lot of methodology. It's not all, mind you, uh, new school, you know, uh, IT based. Some of it might be just, you know, picking up the phone and calling these guys at the right time. But, but you're I mean, using you're using new school to find their contact details. Um, and you're maybe using new like so I've, I've been interviewing quite a few people recently and because uh, I, I, I'm trying to jump into this tech piece a bit better because I don't really have it all figured out. But, yeah. you know, now there's email software where if you have the email list that you download from LinkedIn or whatever, wherever your main, your main mm -hmm. uh, CRM is, um, you can, you can send that email out to them and it tracks what they're up to over the internet. It, 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 uh, the, the different type of, like it also tell, like there's different types of technology now that will tell you when somebody, what type of content somebody needs to hear at the right time there's yeah and, and then and then of course there's what, what what you're talking about as well in terms of like doing the a b testing on on the response rates so it's 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 almost creepy the predictiveness of what's yeah. what's what's out there right now isn't it yeah so my so my startup in san francisco you know we actually ended up turning into a uh what's called an ad tech company but we were really focused on like we were mining the hell out of social media sites and then partnering with them to be able to like Okay, target users. Like, think of you know today all the stuff that's happening on Facebook and getting in trouble. You know, probably Trump and Brexit and everything. You know, like we, I was in you know in the meetings with these you know uh, advertising agencies and marketing agencies having these conversations. Like, I saw this this tech that was being developed and it was mind blowing. Like, and this was happening for years and years ago. It's just nobody was marketing it towards the recruiting industry, and you know, recruiting industry is just a little bit slower to adopt technology. But it's it's creepy that the level that you know that that uh, that they have today. That's why um, you know a lot of people are talking about new regulations and new laws and new rules for how to go about doing this. But for us, I mean, it's at the end of the day, you know, we're talking to a client. They want to pay us a you know a bunch of money to find you know the top person in the market. You know, they're happy to you know they don't care our methods for how we get to go about doing it. We have to find the best people in the market. And as you know, over time, as we work many searches, we're able to build up our our Rolodex of good people, you know, that's kind of, you know, where it all, all begins and kicks off. But that's basically the, you know, on the technology side, we, we made a decision to like, this is baked into our core founding principles of the company is we're going to be, you know, one of, you know, the most technologically advanced recruiting firms um, because it's just, this is the future, this is where everything's heading. And then, you know, it allows us to find, you know, customers that, that get that. So we, we don't want to work with customers that don't get that, you know, that's kind of like, I want them to see our, you know, our, our philosophy and be like, I get this. We want to work with these guys. But I mean, so, I'm, I just, I just enjoy this stuff though. Like, that's why, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure, like, I just, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, no, no let, let me ask you a pointed question. Sure. Um, why, why invest all this money to do this for your own company when you could just grab hire tool off the shelf or candidate ID or one of the other many products that somebody else is using is, is, is your, is your objective to create a consultancy, but also to become a, a software provider as well as. Well, that's interesting. The, the, the first company I worked at in New York, um, they're a company today, they're called Axelon technologies, but they built, so the founder was an engineer and he built, this in-house uh, recruiting tool um, that was phenomenal. I mean, it was way ahead of its time. And what he ended up doing was they ended up basically selling that software to uh, other recruiting agencies all over the world, like all their competitors. They started selling the software to, and he made 
so much more money selling the software than he ever did running a recruiting business. Now, I'm not saying I have the aspirations to do that. However, the reality is, you know, if you're looking at um, that's where the re reoccurring revenue comes. Or if you want to sell a well, company, though, you know, recruiting business is. I mean, you if you stop sending out emails and making phone calls today, in a month from now, you'll, your inbox will be dead for the rest of time. You know what I mean? Like, there's you, if you stop working, this this job is is brutal. I mean, you can never stop. I mean, that's just how the that's just how the model works, right? So I look at it like, look, if you're gonna, you know, and we're just a new startup company, so I mean, sure. you know, I don't like, but if you're gonna acquire a recruiting company today in 2018, you're gonna if you're not looking at okay, what companies, what are they doing from a technology standpoint? Like, you know, I mean, like it's, those are the companies that are going to get bought for millions of dollars in the future. You know what I mean? So like, we're trying to be savvy, but it, reality is it, it helps us our, in our core business, which is make, you know, make placements. Um, but also it allows, allows us to build up new tech. Now we're, we're using off the shelf software too. We're not just building stuff from scratch, but um, you know, it's just uh, whatever the best tool for the job is like, like uh, LinkedIn, for example, like we do almost zero recruiting on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn as a data source is fantastic. So we'll, we'll, we'll use data from LinkedIn, but we're not recruiting through LinkedIn because LinkedIn's not effective anymore. I mean, the, I've tracked the effective rates for years. I mean, it's, it's, it's half of what it was just a couple of years ago. You know, I mean, it's just, so, I mean, that's, that's just, a, you know, you got to stay on top of these trends. Otherwise you're going to be left behind. That's okay. Let's, 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 let's jump into the vision. Okay. So yep. um, I'm getting a feel for, for, for the type of company that, uh, that you're trying to scale. Uh, okay. it sounds really cool. Um, but what does this mean for for that for that agency recruiter that uh, that wants to come and make 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 themselves money, make you money, like be part of something a journey? What does that mean for them in terms of what, what will their day look like using technology that's available? Maybe maybe let's just look at what's yeah. going to look like in two years' time once you have all the stuff figured out. And well, the beauty of it is you can manage the. Uh... You know, you, you could manage a, a a pipeline of candidate contact for a team, for example. You know, one person could manage it for 10, 20 people. I mean, it's it's not that difficult because you're automating a lot of it, right? So I've had this, you know, we already have this today where, okay, you come to the office in the morning or you don't, you work from home or whatever, and your inbox is full of candidates that want to talk, you know, and that's like, you just, you, you, that's, that's where that's where it's at today. Right. Um, so that's, that's a big perk. I mean, it's taking out the the grunt work, the, you know, the, you know, no more, you know, I mean, the, the days of doing a hundred cold calls a day are over. You know what I mean? Like that's, 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 that, that's my greatest pain point. You know, and when I was talking yeah. to Nin, Nin Tran last night on the podcast, mm -hmm. it was the same. If I had a, if I woke up in the morning and I had a, I, I had, I had an inbox full of candidates. And pff, like I'd, I would, I'd place them all. It wouldn't be a problem. Uh, with two hundred yeah. clients, with two hundred clients around the world, like it's uh, oh. that that wouldn't be a problem. But uh, you know, I, I have to, I have to, I have to grind quite hard to get those, to, to get to get the numbers up. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting one. So you see, you see, basically, the the recruiter will be will have a lot of that stuff done. Like so, they'll the, back to my original question: the engineer, the the. the the startup founder wants a VP of engineering. Your recruiter puts that into his system. The system spurts out, like, here's all the people we think. You know, here's the best way of getting in touch with them. Here's the content that you should be sending them. Here's all, here's, here's our eight to 12 touch points of making them know you, like you, trust you. You, you go through all of that that's working in the background. They then have an inbox full of candidates that they're working. They're working to bring to market. They're working to bring to market. Is that, is that basically what you see it as? The, 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 the recruiter of the present, in your, in your view, main job is, 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 is to be almost like just pointing the gun and, and creating influence and, and controlling, controlling the direction of, of things. Is that... Yeah, and then the, the other thing is you could keep you could keep a wide net, so you can build out your list of really good candidates and make sure when they're on the move that you're top of mind to talk to them and stuff. Like, there's a lot of things you can do that you can automate. So over time, you know, you're you have a search, you can get out in the market quickly, and then the you know from the 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 business perspective is you know what we're finding is by having this um uh 
you know, uh, capabilities when the clients are actually, you know, they get like, they're more excited about working with us. So then we're getting a lot of, you know, like we can have a lot of more demands for, you know, exclusive relationships, um, you know, uh, you know, retainer agreements. I mean, like we, we get a lot of things where it makes our lives a lot easier because we're, you, you, have, to, you, have, to, you have, you have certainty of outcome and yeah, and, yeah and, exactly. you're, and, and, and you're matching their culture. Yeah. And we can predict like, yeah, I mean, we can, we can show them data. Like we have clients, you know, every two weeks we meet with and we're showing them, you know, hard data. Here's the number of candidates that we're talking to. You know, here's, we could show them exactly what the candidates are saying, why they're not applying, why they are applying, you know, and we have lots of good data that we're able to, to show them. And it gives us basically some certainty of like, Hey, we're going to fill this role. And um, yeah, I mean, they want to work with us and then it makes it just a good environment, you know, so we don't have to work as hard. We work a lot smarter. And I, I think it's it's generally it's a scalable model. It's just um, what do you, you need know, to scale? Yeah. What what what's you you're, you've only started? Um, yeah. What what what's the greatest uh, what's the greatest obstacle that you face right now? Um, yeah. to, good question. So it's certainly not the clients. You know, I mean, we have no issue with good clients. It's the uh, it's on the candidate side. It's basic because remember we're in Japan. Candidates are very risk averse in Japan, so they don't change jobs as often as they do in other markets, right? Yeah. So it's difficult to get them. But the um, you know the uh, pain points would basically be like, for example, engineering, like we said, right? You know, um, I've talked to some of my my top you know that I know engineering recruiters here trying to get me to join my crazy plan over here but like you know that's something that we could always scale out um other thing would be you know we're not doing anything for uh back office positions because i'm not i'm not personally interested in it but i do know people that that do i'd love to be able to scale out you know more um functional areas that we can work with our clients so we can basically become we want to be entrenched with our clients right we want to be like you know like uh think of like you know a company like a mckinsey right that's like you know, they get in so deep with their accounts that, you know, the accounts don't know how to function without them anymore, right? Like, that's kind of how, you know, we want to be is that level of partnership where yeah. we're, we're like so the, deep. Like the board from Star Trek almost. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I don't know about, you know, if that's because of negative connotations here. Like, we don't yeah. see it as a, as, a, as a partnership, you know? I mean, like, <laughs> the reality is like... Sure, you know, sure, like, sure. Yeah, but, <laughs> Right now, you know, if they come to us for you know certain positions, we we I have to refer them to other recruiting agencies because I know we don't, we aren't you know we're not going to build out those areas surely because we don't have enough people, right? I mean that's just what it comes down to, right? But I mean, and, uh, yeah, and, and I think that there this is a pain. Like I've I've started doing a bit of work uh, as a rector in Japan recently. Uh, okay, because well, there's lo- there's not very the, most of the recruiters are pretty bad there, so. There's a real there's a real demand for recruiters from outside to come in, and um, although you know they are quite risk averse and who they hire and all the rest, so it's a I can imagine that's a pain point finding good people to work for your company. In oh, that, it's in it, that marketplace. It's, it's basically the yeah. I mean, everybody's it's just, it's there's a ton of recruiting firms and they're all fighting over a small pool of people, you know, and it's it, it's it's not. Yeah. I mean, so basically from our point of view is like, you know, from a scaling point, we're not just going to hire, you know, companies start hiring just anybody. Like I, I'm very responsible with the the amount of business that we take on. And unless we have the right person in place, we're not going to add new clients. You know, we have a very, very small client list. We're not expanding out because um, we don't need to. I mean, we're, we're profitable, you know, we make good money, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's brutal. Right. So, I mean, it's going to be a slow, it's going to be, you can't just like throw money at it. Like I, if I took in a, you know, $5 million investment tomorrow, we couldn't find $5 million worth of good people to hire. It would never happen. You know what I mean? So it's, it's pointless. So, I mean, that's a problem for the Japanese market. And I mean, I've heard other rec to rec guys talk about, you know, bringing in recruiters from other markets over here. I personally think it's brilliant because I was a recruiter from another market and I've done very well here. So, I mean, you know, it's, like it, it's it's necessary for Japan. So I mean, it's just a reality. Like we can't just scale and hire a bunch of people. It's not. It ain't gonna happen. So I mean, it's just a reality we got to deal with for our business. You know. Yeah, you just need to get some money, buy a buy a company, and uh, and a, and, a, and absorb them. Yeah, but I mean, does that when that happens though? I mean, don't like don't don't the top pillars end up you know leaving or something? Like, I, I've always wondered about that. You know, when they get acquired. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a tough one. Um, 
I think it's more about systems than, I mean, if you want to really look at it, like, mm. okay, what companies have the best systems that you could throw other people into? But I mean, it's, that's what, that's what the big Western companies do. Like uh, Hayes, for example, right? Hayes bought into the market here, you know, uh, and they've done very well since they bought in, you know, I mean, like. But they have a machine, they, you know, it's a, yeah. and they have, they have, they have the best graduate program in the world. So they bought in, they spent 150 million to buy into America. You know, like yes. Yeah. I heard they spent almost 100 to buy into Japan. That was years ago, though. I mean, it was, it was way too much money, but I mean, they did, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, and then there's, I think that the, uh, I mean, the best recruiters aren't in the big shops. That's probably my, you know, my, my guess, you know, I mean, there, there are a bunch of boutiques. Is probably well, this, what's going this, on. Is, this is an interesting one. Um, and it depends on what you mean by best. Um, mm. So I've been, I've been in a big shop and, 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 and you will find there's a lot of talent. What, 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 what I find is if somebody's in a boutique, um, they'll be quite independent in the way that they want to work. Um, they may not be suited to a business that's scaling and, yeah. and they may be more likely to uh, cut and run. So, so there, there's definitely challenges there. Um, and if they're so talented and they've been doing it for a long time, they're in a boutique, why don't they have their own company? So yeah. the, <laughs> the, the sweet point that I'm always asked for is two to five years um, they haven't had more than two jobs. They've they've built on average two placements a month over a period of time. Maybe mm. they have a degree. Maybe they don't. But you know, it's it, they've a decent, solid background. If they didn't have a degree or they got in early, it's yeah. uh, all of those things are kind of what what you know I get asked for universally around the world because they're the people that you can put into a repeatable formula. Mm, um, and you can train them. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the problem a lot of boutiques are, are the the thing that they're doing wrong is they're they're trying to create a Google culture of, out of recruitment, um, or at least ha- show it on the outside or brand it as such, and then you you take uh, people in, right. and you know, the the thing is you have to do the hard jobs, you have to like at the start, especially when oh, you're building your knowledge, it's a grind. I mean, I did that for when I when I started, you know, in Japan. I mean, I was working 70 hour weeks. I mean, I did that for, for two years, you know, and it was just, that's all you, you got to do because you don't have those relationships. I mean, you got to build them from scratch, right? And that's just the way that it is. But I mean, it's, it, those, and you're right. The younger guys are going to have more stamina to do that and more interest and more passion and more excitement, you know, the less, older guys, less kids and, and all that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the older guys, it's, you know, I mean, they're kind of a little bit set in their ways and it's, it is what it is. You know, I mean, I totally get it. I actually, my, um, my co-founder, you know, I mean, he's a fantastic recruiter, but I, I recruited him at my previous company. I'd known him for years. I trained him, you know, he, he, I, I was, he was direct manager at the previous company. I mean, we, we, we did this together. I mean, we, we, our systems are so, our, our methods are so in sync because we did it together. Right. Like that is, you can't, it's so hard to create. And if you're going to do that, you're going to mold it with a younger guy way more than a, you know, than an experienced guy. And that's the problem with the boutiques, you know, but I mean, like it's, you know, for us, it's, it's honestly speaking for me, for myself personally, and I, I feeling if you, you asked honestly to a lot of business owners about this, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a ROI you got to look at, not even ROI, but it's a balance about how big do you want to scale your business? How much money do you want to make? And how many hours do you actually want to work, right? If I got to hire 10 people, but it means I got to work, you know, an extra five hours a day, I'm not sure if that's worth it, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's just, that's just where I'm at in life. Do you know what I mean? But like, um, that's another thing that's, that's kind of on my mind is, okay, you know, if I got to hire somebody, but it's going to be a ton of handholding, is that even worth it? You know, I'm not personally, I don't think it is. I mean, for me, but it's, yeah. it's, it's a mental I, struggle I, to over I, that. When I, when, yeah, that that that's a t- that's a tough thing, and I've 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 definitely been there and, and have set yeah. up a lifestyle recruitment business, um, and like I, I have a remote a remote team, they need they need very little managing, um, but yeah, uh, I, through doing this and interviewing some of the people that that we have, like Toby Bab, um, the the best companies are have a their owners know where they want to go, they're. And they know that, okay, in order to do that, I need to have all the systems in place. 
and that means and that means uh, KPIs. It means and, and they don't, doesn't necessarily mean monitoring call or every call time, but it means knowing exactly what the recruiter has to do to be successful. And if they're not doing that, then we need to pull them up and educate them on it, and reevaluate and all the rest. So it's the owner has to have the vision. The company has to have a repeatable formula, and 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 then once once that's done. You know, you could be the next GQR or Faden or whatever. Especially if, if if their people are in there right now, calling people they shouldn't be calling because their tech isn't good enough. If they're doing administration that they shouldn't be doing, then yeah. the thought process is that you know you're they're going to have more time to do the quality stuff. So it doesn't necessarily mean like it's the original thought of the four hour work week where you where you kind of live in a beach, but you go okay, well instead of having two amazing hours, every hour that, I, that, that somebody's working for you is doing the high-end consulting piece that's going to make money. And that's exciting. That, that, that's really exciting yeah. where, you're, where you're going with that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm, I'm almost certain, you know, based on just where we're at and the success we've seen. And I mean, we have the, like the systems and the scalable business, it's, it's built today, right? The next step is then, okay, you know, what do I want to do with that? So in my mind, I've already got it kind of, my first thought process is there's a few recruiters that I've worked with in this market that I know that would be valuable, that I know wouldn't require heavy handholding, that already understand the KPIs that, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be talking about and thinking about, you know, and I'm going to go after those guys. And then it's like, okay, then you want to scale it out bigger from there, you know, but I don't, I got to, to be honest with you, I got to research out the, um, uh, what is the actual long-term so what, what is the actual, for example, um, market for recruiting companies in the world right now? You know, is this, I don't want to be, you know, running a recruiting business when I'm 70 years old necessarily, you know? So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, what is, you know, what is the point of scaling up, right? Do you want to just suck as much money out as you can while you're doing it? Do you want to have an exit and get acquired? Or do you want to run a nice long, you know, uh, yeah, a business with a handful of tight clients that are, that love you and you make, you know, lots of money every year, don't work, you know, that many hours. There's all different balances you got to figure out, right? We're a new company, so we're trying to figure out, okay, what is that next step? Mm-hmm. I mean, and that's, you know, actually, to be honest, your, your podcast is fantastic because you get a variety of mix of different people at different stages of their, of their you know, careers and their companies. It's nice to hear the different stories and see where it's at, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've had some really interesting, interesting guests on. One of them was James, James Osborne, and mm-hmm. he's, he runs a non-exec company. So they they kind of jump in and help you out with that vision. So they go, okay, here's where you're at. Here's where here's where here's where X, Y, and Z mm-hmm. got to, and here's how they got to it. And let's work out how you want to get to that point. And and they work along with that and put you in touch with other people who are on that journey. So I it, that That's cool. being yeah, being an entrepreneur is a lonely it's, it's a lonely existence and yeah. um. I've definitely made made a few mistakes and done the lifestyle thing instead of starting out what you're doing and doing the tech thing from from the get go because you know that was my background. I, I did IT recruitment, mm-hmm. um, so it's it, it's really good being able to interview people like yourself or, or like all, all the other guests that I've had who are at different stages where I can kind of compartmentalize all their different journeys into potentially what my own vision will be. And and then just dis- dis- discuss it with people who are along that uh, along that journey. Yeah, I think the um, you know for me, I, I it's I my first step like from a, look at okay, we want to you know like how can I uh, not have the loneliest journey, right? So it, obviously, if you surround yourself with good people that you like, I mean that's one way to go about doing it. But like I see some guys that I know in the market who I've worked with, like I want to almost rescue them from their their <laughs> corporate lives right now because like I just see. <laughs> I tell them, I said, look around your office, you know, who's paying for all that? You know what I mean? Like the, the amount of money you have to make or bill in a big shop in order to make the same amount of money you can in a small shop, it's, it's night and day. And that's something that I think a lot of recruiters don't put enough uh, thought into, you know, is the actual economics of their day-to-day existence, right? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, if you're splitting, you know, I mean, if, if you know, two-thirds of your hard work's going to the house or more or something, you got to work very, very hard to make a a lot of money, you know, and that's something that I think um, is something that we all, you know, we think about, right? And that's, 
it's one thing about owning your own business that nobody can take away from you is, you know, that money goes into your bank account, which is very. Yeah, for so sure. No, they, 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 know, three quarters will go to the, will go to the house easily. You know, yeah, yeah. Especially UK recruitment companies, a lot of them. Um, but then I hate, I hate the Robert Walters, the discretionary bonuses and things like that's, I'm not a fan of that model at all. I just, yeah, I, the, I don't get behind that at all. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I would uh, I would compare it to uh, to to Kaiser to uh, what, what is it Kaiser Soze in the in that, in that movie the, the greatest the greatest trick the devil ever ever pulled was is making people believe he didn't exist. Uh, uh, their model, yeah, look, their model works because they take in good smart grads or young industry professionals, and they make sure that. Mm, there's a guaranteed good base salary, decent, decent enough return at the end. You'll not make big money if you if you become a manager. You'll have a comfortable existence. Yeah. Um, but you know, I definitely had some pain points with their model and how it worked. It was very good for me, but I got to a point where I was like, "Your process is too long. There's too much administration, and I'm having to negotiate for my for my bonus every quarter." You know. In Japan, at least, anyway, I know that they're they're not our competitors. We never run up against them because they focus on this, you know, more really junior mid level positions, basically. Like that's kind of where their sweet spot is, and they own that space. They're very good at it. But like we're, you know, and it makes sense. Like if you have a big, you know, force of recruiters, you want to work when the company has, you know, fifty sales positions. That's where they want to work. We don't want to work the 50, 50 sales positions. We want to work, you know, the director of sales or VP of sales or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of how how we see it. So, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they're filling a valuable need in the market, but the, from the candidate experience is not so great because it's a revolving door of, you know, on, you know, relatively inexperienced recruiters. That's just, you know, the, the business model. So, I mean, like there's, 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 there's ways, there's, there's plenty of places for everybody to exist, you know, wherever they are. We just picked, you know, the, you know, senior level positions in the IT world, because frankly speaking, that's what we find most interesting to have those conversations. I mean, that's just more, you know, it's more interesting to to talk to those people day to day, the people that are really making these big decisions, and then not going up against the um, you know, the hydrogen struggles and those guys. That's a whole different, that's a different ball game. You know what I mean? Mm. So it's like that's kind of where we see the, I mean, where I see the market. You know, and it takes some level of experience to get to this point to be able to succeed at this model that we're doing, but we have it, and it's it's there. And beauty is, IT is such a massive industry that there's so much business you know to go around. I mean, you could you could support hundreds of recruiting firms just in Tokyo, you know, for IT alone. So, I mean, it's it's that big, you know. Fantastic. Well, Ken, I um, really like hearing about your your company and, and your story. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's try and do this in a year from now and see where you're at sure. and have a catch up. I'd love, I'd love to. I'd love to. If you hear of anybody really great that wants to know anything about Japan, let me know because uh, I'm. For better or worse, I'm an expert now. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, yeah, if any uh, anybody wants to get in touch, uh, feel free to email me. I guess or look me up on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's probably the best. Just Ken Charles. Um, that's it. All right, buddy. Great chat, yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Well, there you go, Ken Charles. What a gent. Really enjoyed speaking to him. Almost felt like we were in a bar having a beer, just talking about recruitment. Um, I like his vision. I like that he's putting technology first. I like that he doesn't like doing administration and sees anything that wastes time and isn't efficient is something that wastes money. Um, and it sounds like he's going to create a really great recruitment company. So hope you all enjoyed that one. I thought it was great. And I wish him all the best. And I will try and catch up with him uh, down the road to see what comes of it. But I think we all will all agree that artificial intelligence is going to change everything. So... We're still going to speak to candidates. We're still going to speak to clients. We're still going to build relationships. But everything else that we do on a daily basis that can be automated, um, it will be. And 
you know, anything that's a time waster that doesn't involve you creating influence or building relationships should either be done by a cheaper resource or a machine. And I have a feeling companies like Cairns will be proving me right on this. So big thanks to him for coming on. Really cool company. And I'll have another podcast coming out either today or tomorrow with Nin Tran, who is the founder of Hire Tool. Um, and they're an awesome, awesome technology for recruiters, both agency and in-house. And I think you'll find that one useful too. So I'm going to deep dive on a lot of tech that's out there because I don't know anything about it. So, and like yourselves, I want to make more money. So, um, so bear with me over the next few weeks while we talk to the different tech vendors to see what's out there. And hopefully this will help you structure your plan on on, move, on what you're going to do moving forward. But also, also I, I, I will be putting into practice some of the stuff that, that, that I'm learning here. And with the aim of eventually setting up an IT recruitment company to coexist with our rector rec. So, till next time. Take care. God bless. Thanks for listening. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's 100% free. Sign up now at anchor.fm slash new. That's anchor.fm slash new to get started.